so gorgeous. If you got a chance to go out, I'm jealous. <laughs> um, I also wanted to, obviously, um, of course, gratitude to the land that we're on, the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dun, of the Tan Kwachin Council. Very grateful to be here in White Horse. Ooh, got speakers on. <laughs> um, and lastly, uh, great, uh, gratitude to our sponsors, uh, the Hogans, who have been continued champions of the work we do here, and a big part of the reason why we can share the stories of the entrepreneurs and the change makers here in uh, the Yukon. When we, uh, you construct, uh, decided to create documentary series, there were actually applications to be part of, of this documentary series. Um, and in choosing the entrepreneurs to be featured, um, there were three big questions that were asked around the table. First one is, what stories are going to be inspiring the Yukoners to create businesses themselves? Second question was, how do we, um, which stories are going to create businesses here in the Yukon? And lastly, which entrepreneurs are going to take this opportunity to launch the next level, the next step? Now, of course, uh, John Carson and Scott Kesey from Discovello um, hit every part of that list, but even sweeter is that that story started here at UConstruct. So uh, without further ado, let's watch the documentary. Hi, I'm Scott Kesey, I'm CEO with Disco Velo. I'm John Carson, co-founder of Disco Velo. We're a software company that's trying to make a difference in mental and physical health. I'm a mover and a shaker, and I mean that in a literal sense. Since I was a kid, I found out that if I moved, I could learn better, create more, and be productive. Not everyone has that opportunity, and we're creating a very powerful software tool to give people a chance to move more, understand their brain-body connection, and unlock their superpower. And we're doing this because we believe passionately in the connection between the brain and the body. And we've developed software that connects with any stationary bike to encourage exercise through gamification, biofeedback, resulting in emotional regulation and being able to use our brains in the places where we need them. About 10 years ago, I was part of a nonprofit organization that deployed 6,000 stationary bikes into Canadian classrooms. A few years ago, some teachers requested that we build software to increase the impact of these bikes, and that's what we've done. Our development process is called Lean, and in doing so, we, we work in really short sprints, two to three week time periods where we, we test a product, we get feedback from the market, and then we take that feedback back into the design process so that what we build really hits the mark. The biggest challenge for me so far has been learning so much. This is a new venture and I'm a non-technical founder of a tech company. That can be an advantage actually, but it does mean that, that there's a steep learning curve on a number of things. But luckily we've had incredible support from Yukon Struck Society, from the Yukon government, from our great team of mentors and advisors, and more informal support from a lot of other founders. It's a really supportive community and we're all lifelong learners, so that fits pretty well. Discovello is supporting the local community by embracing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So as people use our product, they learn more about the United Nations SDGs, and we're helping to build global citizens. At the local level, we're employing software developers, therapists. We hope to expand that employment offering as we grow and scale our company. Right now, our software is tethered to traditional fitness equipment, such as stationary bikes. But we see opportunity in other areas where people use their brains and their bodies, at home, in schools, and in the workplace. Yeah, that's it. Heart rate sensor's on, you can start pedaling. Oh, now you're high. <laughs> How will you lower your heart rate and keep pedaling at the same time? Really, ultimately, our mission is to help users manage their emotional and mental health through exercise. We're trying to rebuild the brain-body connection that's been lost, really, and reforge those connections 
to help upskill people to understand how getting their heart rate up can really quickly and effectively get their brain back in a place where they can use it where they need to. So we're here in Yukon for a good reason. There's an incredible supporting environment here for starting business. And we hope to grow this business locally here and to help with the economic development of, of Whitehorse and Yukon. But ultimately, we want our product to be in every school and as many homes in Yukon as possible so that we can bring that emotional regulation and health benefits to Yukon citizens as well as employees and businesses. really good. Yeah, this game is really fun. It lets you exercise while playing a game, and there's a meter that shows your heart rate to make sure you can be as concentrated as possible. I'm trying to get my heart rate up because it's pretty um, low right now. I'm biking in like this frozen desert thing, and I'm trying to get garbage. I'd like to see this in the school because I find Sometimes it's hard to focus. Energy will go into your exercise and your focus will come back easier. Yeah, it gets your brain ready to work again. Yeah. So we've got a big vision for Disco Velo. We're starting small and focusing with youth in classrooms, but ultimately we feel that we can help users of all ages across the globe manage stress and anxiety through exercise. We ultimately see ourselves expanding beyond the education market into home use, workplace wellness initiatives, and even trauma and healing recovery and therapy. Awesome! <laughs> awesome. Well, with that, come on up. Come on up, Scott and John. Woo! Thanks, Kev. Yeah, welcome, welcome. So nice, nice to see you. Yeah. 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 Watch it. Watch it. It was so good. Want to hear me watch it twice. Ultimately, a lot <laughs> it's so hard to watch ourselves on the screen, eh? I can't. Yeah, yeah. It's but great, it's though. moment of pride too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're we're really proud of, of that, and, and the process of putting that video together was really thought provoking for us. So I want to thank mm. Nishka and Lance, and of course the uh, the Hogans and Yukon Struck for for making that all happen because we learned a lot in the process in mm. a way. Yeah, nice. Well, so Scott, I know I've known you since essentially I started here. We had a few conversations here and there, and then John, I think I met you once or twice around the coffee machine before we actually got to sit down individually and get to know each other. Um, and what I found so interesting about their story of entrepreneurship is that it starts with health, but the word health means something totally different to both of you. So, John, what does what does health mean to you? Well, to me, health means uh, humor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to laugh if you're not healthy um, yeah. with both physical health and mental health. So um, if you look at anyone who is experiencing unhealth, usually mm. they're not happy. Mm. And so um, it's pretty easy to boil it down for me in, in happiness and whether... Um, and so whether that's being physically fit or mm -hmm. emotionally in a, in a place to be happy, to laugh, to share your, your emotions with your family, your friends, um, to me, that's what health is all about. Mm -hmm. Does that start with you, with your love of movement and just getting out there and going? For sure. Yeah. I mean, movement is what makes me happy and puts a grin on my face, whether it's running around the block or mm -hmm. playing a bit of pickup footy or... <laughs> Everything puts a grin on my face. Yeah. <laughs> But I feel like your story also starts with running, right? It does. Um, and one of your questions, I think I forgot to mention um, a week ago when you were, we were chatting a little bit about previous business mm -hmm. experiences and movement. Um, I used to sell Nike shoes <laughs> when I was 13 years old in 1976. Um, I was a runner and have been a runner for most of my life, mm. about 50 years now. And we convinced our father to buy a, a boatload, two or three hundred pair of Nikes. And my brothers and I went around selling them at track meets. Mm. Oh, you should have put them in a ball. Yeah. <laughs> they retailed for 18 to 22 dollars. Wow. Anyway, so yeah. I love to move. I love to hustle and sell things. And <laughs> mm. awesome. I've landed here. 
five decades later, it was mm -hmm. the same thing. Did you? How did you discover your love of running? I don't know. I think I probably had to run, or else I probably would have been put on medication. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, we lived um, we lived about a mile from school, and you couldn't stay for lunch, so you had to walk to and from school uh, morning and noon. And so I figured if I ran, I could ran home for lunch and ran back to school. I could see two cartoons rather than. Um, a one. third of one cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to thank uh, Spider-Man and yeah. <laughs> You understood motivation at a young age, obviously. Very, yes. Yeah. 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 What about you, Scott? What does health mean to you? What does health mean to me? It was it, listening to your answer, John. You know what that <clears throat> reminded me of was our uh, was the exercise we did around around values, personal values, and and shared values as co-founders and as a company. As, as part of the boot camp, the inaugural boot camp that we did here, I imagine we'll talk a bit more about that, but um, words that came up in our, in our shared values were health, fitness, happiness, fun, and fun, mm -hmm. right? Fun was mm -hmm. the one, Melissa's here, I think we all, <clears throat> we all landed on, on fun and health, and um, health means a lot of the same things to me as it does for John. I value happiness above, above all else, and fun certainly a part of that. Um, health has, uh, has traditionally or classically for me always been associated with physical health. Mm -hmm. I've, always, I've always been someone who, who moved, unlike John, who gravitates to the, the endurance sports. I'm more of a ballistic guy. I like to <laughs> chuck myself around and... <laughs> with a lot of G-forces, but, um, but that's changing as I get a little bit older. <laughs> Recovery rates get longer. Um, but it has been a really interesting journey for me in the last five years to discover, um, unfortunately, firsthand how health is also, um, it is also mental. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, you know, I've got, I've got some scars from, um, from you know some some previous uh, life experience that has really given me a brand new perspective and a new really a new starting point mm -hmm. on on health yeah um, as part of my motivation with with what we're doing here mm -hmm. and what so it I... is it's more it, it's definitely a, a more robust vision of health now yeah what did it take for you to prioritize health how did you make that realization um, my doctor told me I had to. <laughs> Your doctor told you. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, you know, in, in the in the in the most recent sense, um, mm -hmm. you know, physical health has always always been really important to me, and and um, that's been associated with my love of of the outdoors and adventure, and you know, these chuck me around sports, mm -hmm. um, and so health has been um, has been a byproduct of that lifestyle that I've lived and mm -hmm. gravitated towards. And so, um, you know, some of the turning points for me were when, uh, when lifestyle and work choices were compromising mm -hmm. that health. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I think I've learned not to take it for granted. I've been really lucky up until, you know, relatively recently, take my health for granted. And, you know, it, it's, there's nothing like Nothing like a few knocks to make you realize that it's something that needs attention. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be maintained um, and really needs to be nurtured with, um, you know, with with a lot of focus yeah. and, and intention. Yeah, it's no wonder that health was on the top of that values list, right? Yeah. And what impressed me so much is that you're actually living out that value in work, right? Finding balance within work. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, finding balance in work. Um, well now, so this is uh, this is a sticky wicket. My wife's here, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we should invite her up here to help, help talk about about work life balance. I think we got another mic. So <laughs> um, it is it is always a challenge, mm. and and I think it always will be. Um, what what can I say about that balance? Um, y yeah, it's you know in, in in thinking a little bit more about this, I. You know, I, th I think we talked the other day about there being macro balance, mm -hmm. right? With the big, with the really big decisions, who's doing what job at what time? Mm -hmm. You know, who who has children, who who doesn't? Um, and then then there's you know then there's the micro balance decisions, the you know the day to day, moment to moment decisions about 
um, about you know trying to trying not just to be reactive, mm-hmm. trying to be proactive. That's a constant struggle of mine. Uh, but um, priorities, mm-hmm. really, come back to priorities, right? And so, in I know in our in our work, we come back to to the well really frequently. Um, about our shared values as a, as a company and as a collection of founders and uh, and and people with um, with a vested interest in what we're doing, we we made some promises to each other early on that were based around those values, mm-hmm. right? That we, we would pinky swears. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is the most binding contract anybody could ever offer. Here's some things that we won't comp- <laughs> here's some things we yeah. won't compromise, yeah. right? On um, whatever, and so. Uh, you know, in, in the entrepreneurship journey, you're constantly faced with hard decisions. And the answer may not always be apparent. Mm-hmm. Um, or you may have a gut response mm-hmm. to what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but we that. come back to that, you know, to that touch touchstone of, you know, what, what are these promises to each other? What are our shared values? Mm-hmm. That always steers us in the right direction. Mm-hmm. No, I love that. That was a great yeah. answer. Perfect. Great day. Um, so John mentioned yeah. it in the beginning, how he had this Nike business as a 13-year-old, but you have uh, a, a long list of them, actually, so I'll just name the ones that I think I, I know of. Um, student painting, taste jammers, cards, and then you were selling bikes and also running Run for Life. Like It just feels like it's one thing after the next after the next. So what do you love so much about entrepreneurship? I kind of, I'm a bit of a startup junkie, so yeah. I like getting <laughs> ideas out of the gate. Um, I'm not as good of a closer, so Scott's my, <laughs> Scott comes into the seventh inning and throws fastballs. <laughs> so I really like taking ideas just from yeah from the idea stage and, mm. and building them up, mm. and then having something really special that you can share with the world. And so mm. whether it's a nonprofit group or or a product mm-hmm. um, or an idea, yeah, I like I like to, uh, taking something from an idea. To the, to the next stage. Yeah. Is there a difference for you when you're working, when you're putting your startup hat on versus your nonprofit hat on? I'm learning more and more. So now it's taken me 30 or 40 years of some businesses that weren't so successful. Mm. So I'm hoping I'm learning from some of my mistakes. <laughs> um, and I don't think it's a big difference. I think there's, there's the product development and then there's getting your idea out to the market. Mm. And what I've learned most is that that's a balance. So mm. you can, it's really tempting just to put your whole or your head down and, and, and work on product development without keeping an eye on the market. But mm. at the end of the day, as a business, you always have to sell that product. Mm. Can, so. we, can we talk about the mistakes? I feel like that was like the word that stuck <laughs> out to me. Those business mistakes, right? And I feel like often as entrepreneurs, sometimes we're afraid to, to talk about what we think went wrong. Um, what lessons did you, did you get out of your past businesses that lead you to this one? Yeah, I think my biggest business mistake was having my head down on product development. Mm. I started my post-secondary career as a mechanical engineer. Um, now I'm a massage therapist, so I'm more of a body engineer. <laughs> but I've always liked to tinker with things, whether it's a solar panel or a wind turbine. And so one of my businesses was a, a company that made um, endurance bars, kind of like the power bar that people like G-Force guy here were probably eating as <laughs> he's throwing himself off the cliff. Um, my wife's a dietitian, and, one, and I was a stay-at-home dad, so one time I just created, like many entrepreneurs do, a cool little cookie in the, <laughs> in the kitchen, and I ended up scaling that up to a business that we produced about uh, 1,500 little cookies a day, and I actually made the packaging machine to package all of the food product, which really wasn't my, my specialty. <laughs> I had a lot of fun doing it, but I should have just subbed out the manufacturer of that product and focused on sales. But I like doing that kind of tinkery stuff. And mm-hmm. so my biggest lesson learned was you can't just tinker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have to, yeah, you have to have an eye on the market because at the end of the day, the market, you will live or die by the market. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I know the answer, but maybe these people in this room don't know the answer. How did you two meet? <laughs> you started that? <laughs> Confidentiality, I can't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, you just like, punch me in the shoulder if I'm starting to break that. But, um, um, I had so from all my ballistic sports, I had a real messed up back, and you know, getting a massage therapist in any town, this town, let alone any town, is is challenging. But a good friend of mine just said, "There's this new guy in town. You got to. I think he's got some openings. He's amazing. You got to go." And that was John. 
Um, so yeah, John would, um, he's an incredible body engineer, by the way, um, but don't book him because we need him with the company. <laughs> um, but as he was you know, routinely straightening me out, he'd be telling me about all these incredible endeavors that he had on the go. He's got, had his, his fingers in so many cool things. I alluded earlier to not being in a great place in a previous career. Mm -hmm. um, so my mind was definitely going towards what else could I do. And I left every bloody massage session with you thinking, how can I get a piece of this guy's action? He is mm -hmm. just, he is so passionate about what he's doing. He's making change in the world. Mm -hmm. He's got great energy. It's like checking all the boxes, all the things that I wanted to be doing. Um, and uh, we, we found a way to, to make it happen. Um, that, that's how we met. And um, yeah, there's a whole sequence of, of events after that that, uh, that center around you yeah. construct here. Well, you're setting this up perfectly. So yes, tell me about that. So you decide at that point that you wanted something new in your life, right? You mm -hmm. wanted to feel that passion again. So yeah. how, did you, um, how did you make that happen for yourself? Uh, well, for a long time, I was waiting for the next opportunity to present itself, right? Because I was in a pretty secure um, employment. I was I was compensated well, and the thought of of leaving all of that to to nothing, mm -hmm. to, to not having something, was was kind of terrifying. Um, I was ultimately able to. There it is again. Ultimately, I, <laughs> I was able to bridge um, bridge that to uh, to 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 leave that, and I didn't know what was next. Right, mm -hmm. but I had I had a I had a bit of time to kind of figure it out. So what I did know was that I wanted to uh, I wanted to make a dream of my own come true instead of other people's dreams. I wanted to build something with a team of incredible people. And I wanted to make a positive change in the world doing that. So that was kind of my hit list, right? And so, you know, every time I got an idea, I kind of held it up against the, those criteria. And, and it kind of wasn't presenting itself. So I said, well, what, you know, what can I do to try and make this happen? And, you know, setting the intent, intention is a big part of it. We kind of got to help that along by creating the, you know, the situation. And, and I knew from, from a few friends of mine who were involved in you know, uh, UConstruct, but particularly uh, CoSpace. Now this was around the time after CoSpace and UConstruct had merged. I think they'd just kind of done the ribbon cutting on the amazing building that we're in here right now that combined the, the society and the spaces all together. And I knew from some of those friends at CoSpace that, it was that that's where the innovative thinkers in town were. That's where that was the highest concentration of amazing people making change with incredible ideas and so I just I'm just gonna sit in the middle of all those people mm -hmm. and talk to them all and listen to the ideas flying around until something sticks to me and that's really eventually kind of what happened there were you know some steps and discussions along the way I talked to somebody here who had a neat idea that I thought sounded something like what John was kind of doing and an opportunity that he had so we all went out we all went out for lunch and um turned out that you know a couple of the ideas didn't quite mesh but i had a few thunderbolts in <laughs> in just listening to john really fulsomely articulate this idea and opportunity for building on the success of his nonprofit's bikes in classroom program mm -hmm. sparks fly and you know he he talked about how he'd you know, receive these multiple requests from teachers to kind of level up the bikes and turn them into smart bikes and, you know, and, and make, them, make them powerful in a bunch of different ways. And that just really resonated with me. I found some cool opportun uh, ideas and opportunities and uh, that was it. Mm. And that's what sparked. Such a good story. That's a long one. It's a good I'm one. Sorry. No, it's a good yeah. one. It's a good one. So, just in case the folks in the room don't know about the bikes and Run for Life, John, you want to tell us more about Run for Life and how bikes got into classrooms? Sure, sure. So, yeah, Run for Life is a nonprofit group, and we've been around almost 20 years now. And our mandate um, since the inception was to help kids in classrooms move a little bit more. And so, for the bulk, the bulk of our work was um, supporting elementary school teachers that held um, lunch hour, recess, and after school running clubs. So we'd be the biggest and best cheerleaders for those volunteers, providing them with t-shirts and posters and transportation to school events, 
And about 10 years ago, some of the teachers came to us and said, hey, we know there's a difference in behavior on run club days, but this is Canada, and between November and April, it's really <laughs> hard for us to get access to a gymnasium or to maybe do an outdoor running club. Can you design something in the classroom that gives us that hit of aerobic activity that we know helps and that we don't have to babysit. So we don't want to teach a yoga class. <laughs> and so I, I knew someone in the fitness industry and um, we had a little bit of money in the bank account and we bought 10 commercial grade um, spin bikes that are, that are uh, made for um, elementary school kids, kind of grades one to five, and gave them to our 10 best running clubs. And just said, here, here's an idea, a bit of a hunch. Um, try these bikes out and see what works, or if they work, and that was about 6,000 bikes ago. So schools have come back in, in spades, buying bikes, parent councils have raised money, um, foundations, service clubs, so we kind of, our little hunch paid off, and, but it just showed the real value of movement towards health mm. and towards learning and towards focus. So we initially thought this idea was all about physical activity, but it kind of tended to be more about behavior. Mm. And so we're kind of doubling down on those, on those uh, messages we have. Mm. Six six thousand bikes and growing. Sold four more today. Pretty awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna clap to that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and that model and that model's been copied too, right? Yes, the model has been copied. Uh, we actually had a manufacturer rip off the bike we were selling, and they <laughs> built a better mousetrap, and now we're selling that bike. There we go. It all and, they're, and they're partners of ours in Disco Velo. They're helping yeah. us sell software. Too, they're one so of our channel partners, story. yeah. And I think you would have seen the green bike in the video. Mm. It's not two bikes. Yeah. I can tell the energy between both of you is really good. Even when you're not in the room, both of you say wonderful things about the other. So in business, uh, it's a, <laughs> in business though, um, one of the most important things, right, are the people you surround yourself and your partners. So do you have any advice on uh, how to find a good business partner? <laughs> Probably. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's, a, it's a truth that, you know, you're going to spend as much or more time with your business partner as you are with your spouse. Mm -hmm. So choose wisely. Uh, recognizing the importance, I think, of the interpersonal dynamics is is critical. Uh, you know, in, in, in previous work that I did, we, you know, I, I helped with a lot of hiring. And we used to we used to choose employees based on skill set, right? What's on paper? How qualified are they? And uh, you know, and there's one one example I can think of where holy cow, you know, the just the personal suitability wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't matter how skilled they are if you can't work with them and they don't they don't fit into the culture and the mindset. You can teach the technical skills, right? If you get someone who who fits and is amazing, and you like being around, um, and you can you can laugh together, and um, then it, you know so much else falls mm -hmm. into place. So personal suitability really is a big one for me. Yeah. And John talked a little bit earlier about you know startup junkie and closer. I definitely have a bit of startup junkie in me too, and you can <laughs> close when you want to. But those complementary skills yeah. um, are you know that goes that goes a long way cuz in in business is a lot of heavy lifting and there's a lot of work to do and the better you can uh, you can divide and conquer and deploy your your skills in the in the different key directions you have to go the better mm -hmm. a lot of uh, that. personal chemistry what about you john yeah uh, personal chemistry for sure working together i mean are you a hard worker so mm -hmm. business is it's tough mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's a grind um and look for the skills that you may not have. Um, mm -hmm. Again, Scott has a ton of skills I don't have. Um, I'm a co-founder of a tech company, and I can barely turn on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> I know where my on button is. Yeah. Yeah. But um, we, have, we have great people to, you know, obviously yeah. to do the software mm -hmm. part of it. And so, you know, we're leaders and, and connectors. John's an innovative thinker in the, in the most amazing sense. The way he puts ideas to, and people together who on paper have no business being together. He just <laughs> routinely sees those potentials and gets those things together and sparks fly. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason why your bike program is called Sparks Fly is you, you make those things happen. And I see that every day in our business. And so 
Um, I don't I don't necessarily have that. John's more of a risk taker. Mm. I'm a little more cautious, risk manager kind of thing. So those complementary skills. I mean, even just this morning, we were kind of roughing it up a little bit on that. He's like, go, no, send it. I'm like, I think we should wait. But, yeah. um, but it's, uh, you know, as long as you can have those those discussions yeah. and understand that these are these are business decisions and you know, we've all got the same goal, then yeah, we work through it. Mm. Some of the best advice about choosing a partner that I've ever heard is uh, choose a business partner in the same way that you would choose someone to marry, like a, like a wedding. And so I got really inspired by that. And uh, if, you'll, if, you'll, if, you'll ha- if you'll allow this, uh, I was thinking we could play the little wedding game. <laughs> Are you going to marry us? <laughs> uh, I'm not ordained, but I can have some fun. So if you want it, you'll stand up. Oh, and man. we are going to have you. I'll just move over the benches here. Oh, man. So they'll be here like this. So the important part here, let's just move this up here. Okay. The important part is actually that you take off your shoes. So I'll have you take off your shoes while I set this up. <laughs> I wore mismatching socks. Oh, my gosh. I'm <laughs> Awesome. So now I hope that neither of you have too stinky of feet, um, but I'll have you trade one shoe. So keep one of your shoes and give the other to uh, okay. the other. Hot sweaty shoes. Nice. Less nice. Great. Okay, I, love now, you, I love you, buddy. I'm up for this. Uh, so now I'll have you sitting back to back so you can't see the other person. Okay. Okay. Do we hold the shoes? Put the shoes. You hold the shoes in your hands, okay? okay. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So I'm going to ask some quick fire questions. I don't want explanations. I don't want anything else. What I want is for you gut feeling, answer the question with whoever is the most. Okay. So you use your shoe to, it's your, it means you and the other shoe means the other person. Okay. Any questions okay, so before I'm, we get started? I'm the black shoes. John's the blue shoes. Yeah. <laughs> but I can, oh. Oh, got gotcha. you. Okay. You got it? You got it? <laughs> nice. Nice. So just to make a point about how good this wedding advice is, I actually used um, about 99% of these questions from a wedding blog for this, for this little, oh little game here. Okay. <laughs> Number one, who made the first move? <laughs> We got it wrong, didn't we? You would have done. You would have done. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. Okay, who is the most outgoing? (laughs) (laughs) Hey, hey! No peeking! No peeking! Okay, who is the most organized? (laughs) Nice. Who is the most likely to stay late for work? Okay, and who is the most likely to be late for work? <laughs> nice. Okay, who is the most stubborn? <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, who has the best ideas? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. That was now- an honest mistake. <laughs> Okay, now listen carefully. Who do you think the other person voted for? For Who, what? For that, that question. That Who had the best ideas? Who do you think the other person voted for? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just think about that. It was, it was, it was a thinker. That was a thinker. Uh-huh. Okay, no more of those. No more of those. Um, who exercises more? Nice. Uh, who can finish their beer the fastest? <laughs> you know what? We can test that. Yeah, we yeah, can yeah. test that. That is very <laughs> testable. Um, who is the most serious? <laughs> Classic. Uh, who is funnier? Aww. Aww, shucks. Okay, who has the best taste in movies? <laughs> okay, and who has the best taste in music? <laughs> okay, I'll be well, going. Actually, you know what? No, no, no. John, John plays awesome music when you get a massage from him. Oh, yeah. I like it. Uh, who is the most adventurous? <laughs> uh, who is most likely to last on a desert island? Deserted island. 
<laughs> nice, nice. Okay, okay, and lastly, this one was not included in the wedding list, but who rides their bike more? Awesome, round of applause! Do you get to watch the video after? Yeah. I wanna see if you did. We're all over the place, I think. Here, let's wear each other's shoes now. Awesome. <laughs> Super fun. Cat, you, Doug. <laughs> you did say prepare to have fun. Yeah. I did, I did. That was fun. Yeah. Oh, oh. In the name of health. I hope it was entertaining. I hope it was somewhat consistent. Yep. Thank you so much for participating. That was really awesome, guys. Yeah. Um, so I a few more questions before I want to open it up to the crowd. Um, for me, I really want to know um, what is the most meaningful thing about the work that you do? To each of you, so... Take a turn. You want to start with that? Sure. Um, getting people to think about things a little differently is mm. kind of what really gets me excited. We are a little bit of an outside the box um, company concept, and I think just getting people to change their perspective is, is super rewarding. Mm. And moving forward, some of the content that we're creating is really, really exciting. And so. You can't really say anything about it yet, but Ooh, top secret. <laughs> it's going to be really fun to, when mm -hmm. that kind of rolls out. And I think mm -hmm. um, our, our product now is a little bit of a proof of concept, so it'll be really interesting to, to build that out. And, and I think that'll even make more of an impact. Yeah. 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 Impact, impact driven for sure. Yeah. And about you? Uh, you know, I would agree with John that some of the, some of the stuff that we're doing still under wraps right now mm -hmm. is, is incredibly meaningful for us. If you're talking about what's meaningful to us, that's one of the big things. But I think a little more more, more openly um, is it, I, I feel like I've, I've experienced at an early stage, and I really hope that this expands, is giving some people hope. And, um, you know, we've just had so many in, incredible discussions with potential partners and, uh, and, and people who might be in a position to use what we're developing and, and the hopefulness and the ability to, uh, for, for those individuals to, um, to, to see something that could be helpful for them to improve their station in life mm -hmm. and make their day-to-day their -day and their lives uh, a bit easier is super meaningful. And that's... that's that's kind of what what's getting you know what gets me up in the morning right yeah. now is the you know pushing pushing that forward a little bit every day and you know and and knowing that there's somewhere over the horizon where that's really going to um, gonna kind of blow up on a big level and and we're gonna be able to really create an incredible impact yeah you know. I'm so excited for you both personally to have like be in these in this part of your journey especially for you Scott like finding that passion and for you John like bringing them all together all of your experience to that next uh, way forward so um, what are the next steps for you for disco Velo? Mm, money, money, money. Nice. <laughs> so we like money. We like money. Yeah, it's a big part of it. I mean, we have um, uh, we we have a, a few big directions that we're pushing in right now. I'll break it down into three: uh, product development. Mm -hmm. We're continuing to develop our software. We've got some grants from uh, from CanNor, the Northern Regional Development Agency, from the Yukon Government Economic Development Fund to engage a whole bunch of really cool partners um, and to, to build out our what we have right now as our proof of concept in um, some more pieces and, and content to make it more engaging and more powerful. So we're working on that product development. Um, that all requires money, so as CTO, CEO, sorry, one of my full-time jobs, one of my full-time jobs is fundraising, mm -hmm. so we're we're actively seeking investment um, from a variety of, of places and trying to turn that private money into into matching grant money to fuel our product development. Mm -hmm. And UConn University's Innovation and Entrepreneurship has been an incredible sponsor and partner of ours in in fueling that growth. So shout out to them. Um, and the other big one right now is sales traction. So that's John's department. He's sales guy. And he's he's on the on the horn daily with 
previous customers and new customers, trying to get early early adopter sales. So our beta product is uh, is available for purchase right now. He's the man. Reach out to John. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then thinking about growth and what roles we're going to need to fill and recruiting talent. So mm. a whole bunch of full-time jobs there. No, oh, it's awesome. Yeah. I'm so glad to hear it. Uh, last question, you know, I was taught you can never leave the front of a room without an ask. So how can people in this room right now support you in the next steps? Wow. I just went on. Why don't you take that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the best thing now is, is uh, to help us with traction and sales. Um, mm -hmm. Tell your friends, tell your neighbor, tell your school teachers, your administrators, uh, therapists. Um, yeah, what we're building here, we want to create a solution kind of built here in the north that we can share with the rest of the world. And so we really think it's important to, to prove our concept and and prove our, 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 our worth here at, here at home. So that's the best ask, I think, is just to, to get people on our platform. Totally yep. awesome. We're open for business and, and we're seeking investment. So yeah. <laughs> anybody out there who, who believes in the mission and wants to get in early stage in a, in a high growth tech company close to home, reach out to me. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, that, these are the questions that I have uh, up to the room. Any questions? No, I just want to shout out to Kat for making the film and being um, partners in that. Of course. Yeah. Shakat, thank you for coming. Thank you, Shakat. Super cool. I have a question. Sure. Yeah, Lance. So your new products that you, you're planning to do in the future, are any of them going to be for the government? Because they need to be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So the way we the way we're thinking about um, about our customers and markets right now, if I can use that parlance, um, we have we're focusing right now on what what we call our beachhead market. So John, in his past uh, work with nonprofits and the Sparks Fly Bikes program has a relationship with a thousand customers in Canadian schools, school systems, classrooms. So that's where we go first. And what John's looking to do right now with those sales and those deals is to generate that traction. So that traction in the form of users, ideally some revenue, um, letters of intent, anything that signals uh, purchase or potential to purchase is traction. That traction we can then take to investors as proof of, of that product market fit. So we, we're trying to build that traction in the education market, but we know that what we're building has potential to help users of all ages in all places. So, you know, anxiety and depression are on the rise across the board with age groups. And um, it's not just students who are having trouble focusing, using their executive functioning and problem solving and decision making and respectful communication skills, uh, that applies to the workplace as well. So there's a recent study that, um, that finally kind of quantified a return on investment for corporate wellness programs. At $1.62 in benefit for every dollar put into workplace wellness initiatives, there's a true positive financial return on in investment there. Uh, and so we have been thoughtful about those um, different markets for expansion and application um, for, right from the beginning, truly. Um, but we had great advice to think big and focus. So our focus is, has been on, you know, on, on, edu on the education market to start. But we are, um, just today I connected with someone who's got a, uh, a startup in Seattle, I think, Seattle or Vancouver, uh, focusing on uh, trying, to, um, trying to measure the impact of corporate wellness programs in, in workplaces and, and looking for some collaboration to do that. So it's a great question, Lance, and it's certainly on our radar, uh, corporate wellness initiatives, as are um, concepts like trauma and healing, um, PTSD, we see, for example, uh, applications in with first responders who have uh, you know, high incidence of traumatic stress 
and also spend a fair bit of time hanging around trying to stay in shape, um, getting ready for, for, uh, for response calls. And so we feel like we have something that we could offer there as well. So, you know, we keep, I keep using this analogy that, you know, when we look around in Alder, we can't see the horizon in any direction for where we could go. Um, but we do need to be step, you know, stepwise in how we approach it. And I, I think those steps are gonna come um, age-wise. So elementary school, middle school, high school, adult population, yeah, workplace environments, senior care homes. So there, <laughs> we've got kind of mm -hmm. the uh, home, home use as home well. Use, yeah. Yeah. Are your avatars and scenarios built out for children specifically now, or is it a case that you can uh, scale up to adults quickly? It's a good question, um, and, and I think the answer to that might be less about the avatars and more about the, the complexity of the activities. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, you know, without having, having a demo here, we probably could have. Um, if you want to see it, we could probably wheel something over later, but, um, you know, effectively what our product is that the student sees is, um, is a video game that is powered by heart rate and cadence of, of the bike that they're on. So it's effectively exercise controlled, but that game environment is bracketed by, um, by emotional and physical check-in and check-out. So there's data collected on a baseline and then after activity, that data is available uh, to the teachers on a, on a web-based dashboard. So they can see some metrics on how the students are doing in these different areas. And then um, eventually we will be building that functionality out so teachers can use it for reporting purposes as well. And uh, so that game environment is, uh, is relatively simple right now because as John said, we're starting with, uh, with younger children. Um, and, but we have, we have plans in place to expand the, the complexity of those. And of course, you know, the graphics would need to be, be you know, a little more developed and that gets more expensive. So again, comes back to money. I just, as I watched the documentary, I was like, there's such a huge, and you've touched on it when you're talking about corporate wellness, such a huge, potentially a huge enterprise mm -hmm. play in this. So I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Um, it's probably a conversation you and I can have in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I see that. I love your ideas. I know you're in, you're in a similar space, so um, if you're on the live stream and you, and you can't hear the question, it was about how, how easily can the games and the graphics be scaled up for, for older users. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the pathway is there. Um, it's, you know, it'd be a, a, a question of having the right talent and having the money to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. I thought I saw another hand over here. Yeah, Michelle. Um, I'm curious about rec centers or like a community fleet where you know the family be could become more involved, and also whether you said it might be available for sort of individual family use, kind of. And I have no con no sense of the cost involved. Like, is it is it something that you need to be an organization to own, or is it something that is it, is it what is the entry level sort of for cost, I guess, or approximate. We are just in the process of figuring that out. Okay. Yeah, um, but it, but it won't be long, Michelle. The question was about was about home use um, and rec centers and fleets and what the what kind of the entry scenario is for for the software. Um, we have uh, the 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 pricing and the infrastructure and the software that we have built right now is kind of custom built for for classrooms. Where uh, where there's an administrator, principal, or you know, or kind of uh, administrator level that would onboard teachers, and then the teachers would onboard all of their student users. Uh, so it's that model is not um, not as well suited for individual home use as it could be, and we don't have the pricing developed on that. We um, Interestingly, I have a discussion lined up with this person over here to <laughs> to uh, explore some of those ideas and try to get a try to get a um, a sense of that product market fit in that particular market. So, timely questions. I'm not prepared to quite answer them in detail right now, but 
Um, John, do you want to talk about bike labs and that concept? Because that maybe touched on Michelle's question yeah, about yeah. fleets so, and rec centers. Yeah, so we're looking at a few different ways. So we sell software that will work on any stationary bike. So you don't, it'll, if you have a stationary bike at home, you could tether that to our software. So that's the market entry is, is pretty easy there. And, and on a monthly subscription, it might be anywhere between $14 a month and, say, $30 a month. So that's kind of the, the will be the, sorry to... <laughs> no, see, risk taker, risk, taker medic, <laughs> risk manager, go for it. So you're looking at, yeah, roughly call it 20 or $30 a month for the software. Um, and then when we look at fleets and other custom equipment that, um, that can go out to rec centers, so for instance, a rec center would need a, a specific holder for the tablet, so if someone is on the game, it's not going to kind of kind of fall off and break. So we have our uh, some of our manufacturers looking at some custom kind of tablet holders that would make that fleet possible. And so roughly the cost of a bike with the software and the sensors is in about a thousand dollar a bike range for a commercial grade stationary bike, including the tech and the sensors. So and we it's not like a three thousand dollar Peloton. It's it's quite reasonable, and that's shipped anywhere in Canada. So price points really really good. Yeah, but the model you're talking about with the schools, you could, if you adapted it to a rec center, people that have membership and that then are following their fitness and whatever data that you're collecting, there could be that could be part of their membership. Mm -hmm. yeah. That yeah. Information. yeah, certainly. There are some there are some really uh, intuitive and relatively straightforward leaps from the classroom to other markets that that uh, that I, that we're we're exploring, and I think we'll really easily be able to do. But there's yeah, there's a few few things to check off before we get there. Make a note though. <laughs> Great, so I think that's all we have for time, but if you have any more questions, I'm sure you'll be sticking around. Mm -hmm. There's some beer, so we can test down who's going to be drinking their beer fastest. <laughs> Um, and there's Mr. food Blue as well. Shoe. Yeah, Mr. Blue Shoe. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, a round of applause, thank you so much. Thanks, Kat, that was fun. See, it's all good, it was gonna be fun. Yeah, yeah, awesome. totally. Great. Thanks, Rick. Yes, thank you to Rick, thank you to Victoria. Woo.